Hello, welcome back. This is our fifth meeting of the Open Textbook Network's Pub 101. I'm delighted to see you all here. I, um, I'm going to start by sharing that I was reading your unit feedback and somebody quite understandably mentioned that all the things involved in a publishing program can be a bit overwhelming. And I just want to acknowledge that truth. It definitely feels that way, especially when you're reading through everything for the first time or trying to get a handle on sort of the big scope of things. Um, and so, you know, take it uh, day by day and, and remember that as you work on a project or start your program, um, you can go step by step with the support of others in the community um, and don't have to, you know, try and get a handle on everything at first glance. You can also, of course, pick and choose what you're able to offer and therefore what kind of project management you might be doing um, by sharing, you know, what the professional publishing programs do is by no means to imply that you should do it this way. There are so many ways to support authors and so many ways to publish a book. And um, even though we're talking about a lot of moving parts and options, you can always select what's doable and leave the rest of it on the table. And I know Corinne will talk a little bit about that um, later today. And then, you know, it's a, a good thing to keep in mind next week too, we'll be joined by Elvis and Mike who work at Scribe, which is a publishing services provider. And so they're gonna be talking all the things they do for their clients, for publishers. Um, but really that's meant to be more of like a, a background. Um, when you can sort of uh, hear from them how they do it, but then again, adjust as you're able to do it um, with the resources that you have available. So on the note of thinking about what resources you have available, I'm showing, I'm sharing a um, link in the chat. This is uh, a small workshop I'm inviting you to called Doing It Your Way, Designing OER Publishing. And it's offered as part of the Open Publishing Fest. Uh, we are partnering with COCO on a, on a project here at the OTN and they're putting on um, this new fest with a bunch of different partners. And they have a really fun program planned. If you haven't seen it, um, I'll, I'll pull up their program a little bit later in our meeting and share their calendar with you. But they also have entertainment, they have movie screenings, they really broke away from sort of a conference format. So um, I invite you both to sign up for a workshop, which will be hosted um, by different members of the publishing co-op, and also to take a look at the Open Publishing Fest calendar in general. So far in Pub 101, we've talked a lot about front-loading work, accessibility from the beginning, those CFPs and MOUs, uh, to define and communicate your publishing program design, and now we're going to talk a little bit about um, what to do when authors are writing and turning in their manuscripts. Now you may remember that last week Carla mentioned that timelines are not always predictable. Um, she recommended adding six months to your timeline to allow for um, life to happen, like, oh, a pandemic, or an illness or simply being overwhelmed with too much at work, a lot of things can throw schedules into disarray. And what I'd like to highlight is not to forget to give yourself the time you need to bring a project home. So if you're planning on giving a year for authors to write, give yourself a few months to work on the manuscript once it's finished, depending of course on your role and give yourself some wiggle room, especially in the very beginning when you're, when you're learning um, how, to, how to do all this stuff. Um, and make sure, of course, not to just have these months in your head, but clearly communicate that you will need time to turn around um, the project if you are providing services. Um, I think it's helpful for the author to understand that too, so that you both, both aren't frustrated with, you know, one week before the semester starts and the expectation is that you're going to get a textbook out there that students can access immediately. Um, so related to the, the phase that Corinne's really going to uh, talk about today, the writing and production phase, there are two elements that I'd like to highlight that you read about um, in the publishing curriculum. The first are style guides, and probably most of you are already familiar with style guides. 
they really can simplify your life and your relationship with the author and the whole process of preparing to publish. So I recommend determining a style guide at the outset if possible. And it doesn't even have to be like APA or MLA necessarily. It could just be something among authors, particularly if you're working with a group of authors to say, you know, we really refer to fill in the blank term, we're always going to call it this thing rather than this similar word that sometimes other people use. It's, it's, it's that kind of, the style guide has that kind of goal so that there's clarity and consistency among people working on a project and then among the readers who are reading that book. So um, I have my own example of being inconsistent. Uh, last time I uh, held Pub 101, some of the feedback I got was that the uh, publishing curriculum, the Canvas course, I had switched at some point from AP to Oxford comma styles. I was inconsistent and somebody noticed that and it distracted them from uh, the content of the curriculum. So, um, you know, it, it, it happens and it can take people out of what you want them to learn. The second um, thing I would like to introduce you to is the concept of vetting. And to vet a manuscript or to vet a project is a term that you'll hear uh, Scribe use next week. And it's exactly like it sounds. You're vetting the manuscript. What do, what do we have here? What are the problems? Um, using a checklist, you're trying to assess what work might be involved to um, make sure that that manuscript or that book is in the best shape for public readers. Um, you can absolutely develop your own vetting list, much like you can develop your own more informal style guide. One thing that might be on the vetting list, for example, could be checking for alt tags. Um, when you see, if you, if you peruse the units that include some of the scribe terminology and workflow, you'll see their vet list and it is immense and it can be really overwhelming. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, oh my gosh, get me out of here. I, I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna do that kind of vetting. Um, and on the other hand, it's also, I think, just a good reminder that typically there is a lot involved with publishing. In a world where we have a lot of one button publishing, um, it can be easy to forget that there is sort of this other universe where many people are involved in a publishing project, offering their expertise, making sure that the, the author and the content is being communicated in the best possible way. It may also be helpful um, to look at those vetting lists or to look at sort of um, the, the many things involved in publishing a project if you do have some funding. And I know that um, in, in these times, it might be especially hard to come by funding, but in the past, there have sometimes been scenarios where there's a pot of money and not a lot of time and the, the uh, uh, impetus is to get out, you know, X number of open textbooks. And sometimes that can be a, a good argument for saying, let, let the pros do it. Here are all the things involved. I want to just hand this over. They're going to know how to make it great. And I can, you know, facilitate sort of the back and forth. So vetting and style guides are two things that Corinne Guimont, the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Virginia Tech Libraries can speak to. So if you have questions about those things after her presentation, um, please let us know. We're also gonna talk a little bit more about style guides next week. Now, to prepare for today's session, I asked you to bring one top tip or strategy that you consider helpful for managing projects and communications among project teams. Um, I'm going to put that in the chat just in case you missed it in my email last week. One top tip or strategy you consider helpful for managing projects and communications around project teams. And I asked you to think about this, not just because it's helpful to share strategies, but also to, you know, emphasize again that you are all experts in getting things done. And our role in the OTN is really about surfacing and leveraging your collective knowledge so that we can support one another in moving forward. So in that spirit, and um, to hopefully meet uh, perhaps a couple of people you haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'm going to break you into small groups, about five people, and give you five minutes to share your top tips 
Don't forget to do introductions if you haven't yet. And um, I would also like you to add your tips or strategies to our class notes for meeting five so that everybody can see them collectively in our document. So I'll, I'll send you those notes in your breakout groups so you have that support. Um, but for now, I'm going to break you guys up, or so I think. Somebody, somebody um, I noticed right when I said break you into groups, um, our, our participants dropped by one. And now I'm looking and Zoom did an update and I don't see where the breakout groups are anymore. They have changed locations. So I think that means you guys are off the hook. Let's, um, let's instead share them um, in our large group here. Luckily, we're not too large. There's 20 of us. So I'd really appreciate it if a few of you would put the top tips or strategies in the chat or unmute and share. And um, let's do it that way since, um, since breakout groups are now a mystery. Susan. Yeah, um, I've attended a lot of Zoom sessions. This happens to be our bridge week on our campus. And of course, we're Zooming everywhere. But something that's come up constantly, whether it's the discussion of moving from face-to-face -to, -face to online or creating and designing your new course, and having been an online student myself as a graduate student and also last year in the Creative Commons course, uh, communication, regular communication to me is, is so key in any of this, especially if you're gonna be managing a project. You need to really discuss maybe through weekly meetings. We're doing this at work anyway, well, remotely, but we have weekly drop-in sessions where we just sort of keep everybody up to date and in looking at all the pieces that I've been reading about in the notes and everything, um, it's really important to keep everybody together uh, mm -hmm. in a regular, timely fashion. So that's my- Absolutely. Opinion. Weekly meetings, thank you, Susan. I totally agree and um, not to give too much away, but I've seen Corinne's presentation <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she would say the same thing. So even if it feels like, gosh, what are we going to talk about? We just saw each other a week ago. Just having a standing meeting is really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I see a couple comments in the chat. I also see, Julie, that you raised your hand. And um, I would like to call on you. Yes. Thank you. Um, one of my top tips for working with people would be to um, come up with a standardized file naming convention and make sure that you date it with year, month, day so that um, you don't get into the, the situation where somebody has written final, draft, old, new, final, final, <laughs> real final, um, because that has happened and it's really annoying to try to figure out which draft is the correct draft to be working from. But, you know, even with... Um, Images, you know, you could say C01 underscore I for image or whatever, you know, media type you want, just so that you can sort them easily by their file types, their names, the order they appear in the chapter, and again, append the date, year, month, day at the very end, so you can keep track of which, you know, even with your audio files, video files, pictures, tables, whatever, you can keep track of the, the versions by using the date. Absolutely, Julie. Thank you. That is such a good tip. Um, I'm definitely guilty of poor file names and it drives uh, drives you and it drives other people crazy because you really can't tell what final final meant. Anyone else care to share? I have a, um, a tip. Great. Go ahead, Joshua. Um, my top tip is to make sure that before you start an um, endeavor into a project that you create some kind of initial document or file, whether it be an outline or um, a set of goals or some just some kind of 
concrete thing that you can refer back to as your discourse evolves over the course of the project. Um, you don't want to get into a situation where someone says, oh, but you know, you didn't say that in our initial meeting. You didn't set your expectations for what you wanted from me because um, you can say that you did. But also then you have a document that can evolve with the project and help keep everyone who's collaborating on the same page about what you should, um, what you should be working on. Yes, I see Corinne smiling and nodding. Corinne, feel free to chime in. Uh, I, you know, there, there's the MOU, there's the CFP, there's these formal documents, but then yes, also documenting your conversations, you know, the new agreements and understandings that you come to um, after meetings. Absolutely. Thank you, Joshua. There's so many good tips uh, in the chat too. I'm just going to to look at them so that um, we can hear them all. So Catherine says, run things like memos, surveys, et cetera, past the larger team. In addition to transparency, I find that fresh eyes and outside perspectives really help. Yes. Amy, set forth the timeline and deadlines in a table and present this to authors upfront, including email outreach dates. Including is in all caps here. Mark each deadline in your personal calendar. Having the communication scheduled upfront is great for accountability. Amy, I'll just say that in, internally on the OTN team, um, often we will joke, you know, make a table because Dave Ernst is a huge fan of the table. Um, so tables can be really helpful rather than um, having to read through a long narrative. Sarah, a Kanban board. I'm not familiar with those and I'm not even sure I'm saying it right. Can you tell us more about those boards and how they help you see the big picture? Yeah, um, it's something I kind of came upon um, recently because we all, I know we, I was already overwhelmed with my life as it was, and then we all got sent home and I just got triply over, overwhelmed with all the, mm -hmm. the projects going on. And so um, it's a thing that comes from um, like tech, let me try to throw a picture in uh, to the chat, with the idea that you could keep track of, I don't know if that link will work, um, of what's backlogged, what's in progress, what's kind of in test is how they use it in like a in a techie way and then what's done so it's a way for you to see literally at a glance because i'm a person if i put it digitally it i might as well have forgotten about it because it's not looking at me in the face mm -hmm. so um you can look at something and see a huge project in front of you but broken into the little pieces of what's what can you immediately work on what are you waiting on and more importantly what you've accomplished because I feel like in a lot of big projects, um, we don't really stop to consider what we've accomplished because um, the, there's always more to the project to be done. And so that lets you kind of see and demonstrate where, you, what, where you've been. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate the reminder. It's so easy in our work lives to not stop and reflect and celebrate what has been accomplished and sort of this feeling of like, oh my gosh, I'm a hamster on a wheel. It just keeps going and going. Could be a little overwhelming, especially right now. And the link did work, Sarah. Thank you for sending it. And you know, I can't help but notice how all of the, the digital boards look like sticky notes on a wall or what used to be a cork board. So um, it's nice to think about moving things from one column to another. Um, Sue says, when sending an email, I make a numbered list of the topics covered in the email at the top so readers can see which numbers are important for them and which are not. Nice. It's almost like a table of contents for an email. Uh, Morgan also likes standing meetings. Lisa's still trying to figure out SharePoint and Teams and uses email strings to search out uh, conversations. Arnie says, be gentle with folks about deliverables and deadlines. I like that. Um, it's a good reminder that I think we're all human and, and gentleness is always appreciated. Um, and Slack and Trello, Carolyn likes both of those. I use both of those as well. Um, depending on sort of what, what hat I'm wearing at my job, I might be in Slack with um, developers who work on the library. I might be in Trello with a student assistant and then using Asana for other projects um, among teams. So thanks everyone so much. Um, feel free to raise your hand if, if there's anything else you'd like to share, but I think these are great tips and I appreciate your reflection and sharing of them. I am now going to launch us into a poll. I'm happy to report that polling is where I left it in the Zoom toolbar, so I think we should be good to go with that. 
Uh, poll four is called Getting Things Done. So here are some questions for you. Are you able to read the entirety of the question or does it just drift off in a dot, dot, dot? Somebody please answer. I can see it, uh, first question and part of the second where I'd have to scroll down to get to it. Right. Okay, but you can see that for me, the entire question is when I'm on a tight timeline, I'm going to, oh, because that is a question. Sorry. <laughs> that was my cognitive difficulty. I'm going okay. to, that's what I <laughs> okay, when I'm on a tight timeline, I'm going to, are you going to start right away because you like to finish things before the deadline? Are you going to think about starting right away, but not get to it for a while? Or are you going to stress out about the timeline, start the night before and somehow pull it off? Or are you the type of person who refuses to be constrained by something as arbitrary as time? Um, just take a moment to reflect about how you typically do with deadlines and timelines. The second question, you've got to contact faculty about a deadline they missed. How would you describe your communi communication comfort level in this situation? So to Arnie's point, a deadline has passed and you might be gentle. Um, would you rather have dental work? In other words, you're not comfortable about contacting faculty about a deadline. Maybe it's not your favorite thing, but you can get it done. That looks like the vast majority of you. And then um, some of you live for uh, confrontation. Number three, what do you find to be the most effective mode of communication with faculty or at work? A lot of people here loving email. Many of you like in person, I put a little sad face for obvious reasons. Um, there's also phone and online chat. Number four, final question. Do you use a project management tool you would recommend? And it looks like most of you have replied. So here are the results. Pretty split in terms of how this group um, works with deadlines. So kind of a three way split. Most of you like email, lots of people making their own spreadsheets. And then there's some other, and you guys have been typing in chat. So that looks like um, a, a general conversation. If you want to share a project management tool and you haven't yet in the chat, please do. And um, feel free to carry on chatting in the chat. And now, without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Corinne. As I mentioned, she is Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Virginia Tech Libraries, and she's going to share with you how she handles the author writing time and production time. So over to you, Corinne. Great. Thank you. And it was great to hear some of these tips. Of, like Karen said, a lot of them I cover. So um, it's good to know that we're all kind of on the same page starting this. Oops. Share my screen really quick. Okay, so we're talking about communication tools, strategies, and project management. These kind of go hand in hand a lot in my mind, just in terms of communication being such a key component of project management um, and making sure that throughout the project's life cycle, you are communicating properly. I think that was brought up by several of you. Um, in your tips in the chat and, and Zoom. So as Karen said, I'm the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Virginia Tech. I'm in our publishing unit within the library. Um, I work specifically on open educational resources and digital humanities projects. Um, but our publishing unit also has monographs, journals, student book projects, and we're also branching into the world of podcasts, which is kind of fun and exciting. Um, and then I also kind of have a unique experience as several years back, almost five years ago now, which is crazy to think about. I worked briefly for, as a content digitization project manager at Cengage. So I was really kind of in charge of overseeing that production aspect of eBooks or eTextbooks um, and working with our vendors to make sure all of that got done. Um, so when working with authors, the first thing to think about um, and somebody said this too, defining the expectations. I think it was Joshua who said having like a concrete um, document or something to really have those expectations. And some of that should be in your CFP and your MOU. 
but it's also good to have it elsewhere too, maybe a less formal spot. So it's not always like, hey, I'm gonna bring this very official document to these meetings to discuss <laughs> what our goals and expectations are. And then as I saw Andrea put in the chat, finding the best mode of communication. You know, for me, I really like email. Um, I don't, I'm very little at my desk when I am at work, <laughs> which hasn't been in a few months. Um, but I'm not really somebody to call on the phone. I did have a, a researcher I was working with who was emailing me frantically going, I've been calling your office phone. And I'm like, I, I haven't been at my desk all day. <laughs> um, so thinking about some of those things. In person, sometimes people work best like having that weekly meeting and checking in in person all the time. Obviously right now that's probably not happening and thinking about other methods such as Zoom or Google video or I don't know, Facebook video is a thing. It sounds like all, like everybody has a video platform right now. It seems to be the, the, the big thing for some reason. <laughs> um, and then also messenger apps. I've, and somebody mentioned Slack in the chat as well. I love Slack. I use it all the time to communicate with some of my colleagues. Um, Gchat is also really popular. Um, I can't think of any other ones. Uh, a few people mentioned, I think Teams, or I know I used to use, um, Skype for business. And then there's also project management tools. So it's also possible to communicate through like commenting features within project management tools. When I worked at Cengage, we used JIRA. So we would communicate with our vendors through kind of the ticketing system in JIRA to be able to let them know um, everything that was happening with the project that way. The benefit of that too was that it was all within the system. So if somebody outside of myself or the vendor needed to access that, that communication, it was available. And then setting a regular time to check in. That could be monthly, it could be weekly, bi-weekly, bi-monthly, quarterly, depending on what kind of your schedule is, is a good thing to think about. Um, so tools always come up, project management tools specifically. So I would, I like to talk about it a little bit and really emphasize the point that the tool is really only as good as how you're using it. Um, so some really good things to consider while looking at project management tools or applications are are you at the same institution as the author and the rest of your project team um that kind of feeds into the next point of do you have all have access to any specific tools a lot of times institutions will have a license available for specific project management tools that you might have by default that could be a good starting place to look into i know i use basecamp for a project right now and we have a license through our library to use basecamp so we're able to kind of access the full suite of tools that basecamp offers um, because of that license um, also thinking about other tools you're already using it can be kind of stressful when you realize that you have three different project management tools for three different projects <laughs> So thinking about, oh, hey, this is a new project. Is there a way I can leverage this tool that we're using elsewhere? And also thinking about other tools the author might be using. Um, if they're really comfortable and they use, say, Trello for everything they do, is, is it good to jump onto Trello for that case? And then, like I said, it's only as good as how you use it. So does everybody know how to use the tool? And if not, are they willing to learn? Is this gonna be a scenario where you say, hey, this is the tool we're using, this is the workflow we're following, and then instead of putting a comment in your ticket in JIRA, somebody goes, no, I'm just gonna email you instead. That kind of breaks the system and can sometimes add extra work on either for you or somebody later in the future. So some common tools to cover here, and I think each tool kind of has their own like key features, so these are kind of important to know about, and these are some of the ones I've used regularly, so I'm bringing these up, um, but Basecamp, I mentioned that. So that's really kind of like a to-do list thing. There is a chat functionality in there, and I think there's a way to share documents in there as well. Um, but it's really nice because you can assign people to do items. And as a user for myself, I'm not the project lead for the, pro the project I'm using it on, but I can go in and I can see all of the items just assigned to me and when they're due and what communication has gone along with each of those items, and that's really nice. Asana is very similar in that respect too. JIRA, like I said, is a ticketing system. It's very commonly used with IT folks um, and can be really complex to use. I wouldn't really recommend it unless you're already super familiar with it because just setting it up in a workflow that works for you can be a full-time job within itself. Um, 
And then Trello, I think several people mentioned, I'm not super familiar with this one. I haven't actually used it for a project, but I do know there's kind of that dashboard functionality that allows you to kind of move your items to different areas. And that seems like it could be very productive, especially for a publishing project and thinking about, hey, this is what phase it's in and this is what phase it's going to next. Um, kind of my pro tip is to think about if it's not a tool that you're signing into every day, if you're not going to go into your base camp every day and see what's going on, setting up your email notifications so that way you're getting emails when something's happening. Um, so I mentioned I use base camp for a project. I don't go on base camp regularly. I think I use it for about two projects. But I do have the email notification set up. So when the project lead assigns me something, I immediately go, oh my goodness, this is something I need to look at. Or sometimes I ignore it. And then a few weeks later, I get a reminder of, hey, you still need to do this. Um, and that's really helpful for me. OK, so hopefully you've kind of established your tool, your communication method, your check-in times. Um, what are the specific things you should discuss early on in the process, but kind of before your author starts writing? Again, these are likely established in your CFP and MOU, but it's always good to revisit and make sure you're having kind of like open conversations about these things. Um, so the main, one of the first things I would say is the end result. Who are the end users in the audience um, beyond just kind of the broad category, say college students? Is this a first year writing course or is this like a fourth year highly advanced engineering course? Um, we've done several <laughs> engineering textbooks and knowing that those are geared towards like juniors or seniors is really helpful for us as publishers to recognize that the material should be more complex. Also knowing what the book itself should look like. Um, are they looking for something that's just available online, just in an ebook format? Are they hoping for something in print? Do they want something that's available both ways? Are you trying to set up a print on demand thing? And also even with that online format, are you looking at more of like a press books ebook format or are you thinking more of like a PDF available online? That can really help determine your workflow throughout the process as well. And then how does this book fit with the other works, both your works as a publisher as well as theirs? Um, if they're trying to suddenly develop a book in a system you've never used before, does that fit with kind of all your other books that may be published with as a PDF online? And is that something you're interested in doing? Is that an area you want to grow your publishing program into? I think that's something really interesting to consider. And then how does it fit with their works? Have they published other textbooks before? I think that's a really good question to ask. Um, does this kind of build off of some of their past publications? Or is this kind of completely out of left field um, that can kind of help you gauge kind of their leading into the next point, their past experience? Um, an author who's written other textbooks before kind of has a little bit more experience in terms of being able to identify, I believe at this point you've all talked about kind of the common components of a textbook. Okay, this is where I need my learning objectives. This is, I need my key terms. Here's the content, here's the examples, references, et cetera. Um, that might come more naturally to them that somebody, to somebody who hasn't. So kind of having a good idea of what their past publishing experience is. However, that's not to say that past publishing experience with a monograph or a journal will not also be beneficial because um, that will also tell you what kind of expectations they might have. And then rights and licensing. I'm sure you all have talked about this plenty, but making sure again and again that the author is aware of the rights and licensing issues, especially when it comes to as they start writing and they find images or other content that they want to build off with, making sure that they are clear on terms of the copyright licenses and the, um, the Creative Commons licenses and how to either incorporate those in or build upon those or whatnot. Um, it's happened several times that in the middle of writing a book, we've had an author be like, oh, but I want to use this image. And we've said, that's not openly licensed. Oh, but it's, it's fine. I'm just going to use it anyways. And no, no, really, it's, it's not open. <laughs> it's not available. So I think kind of revisiting that conversation as much as possible is always a good thing to do. And then also thinking about how this fits within their professional development. And this also kind of ties into the time commitment aspect, um, especially when thinking about faculty and professors. If they're up for tenure, does, this, does writing this count as part of their tenure um, and their, their tenure and promotion? And if it does, that's fantastic. How does it tie into the kind of the dossier they're building? If it doesn't, 
how much time do they have to do it? Or is this something that they're kind of going to start and then say, okay, now you finish it. Um, or is this something that they're really committed to and they're able to do? It's kind of a hard conversation to have, but it's a really important one to have because the last thing you want is to end up with a half finished book project on your hands. Um, that maybe you've started as a publishing program kind of pushing some serious resources into you, but there's really not, it's not possible to get finished. Um, so having that conversation early on is really important and kind of gauging in terms of where they stand. Because sometimes you can also loop in other authors. Maybe there's somebody else on campus or you can reach out to one of the listservs and see if anybody else knows of another author who might be willing to collaborate that might make that a little bit stronger um, in terms of the time commitment aspect. And then the fun question of schedule, which it sounds like y'all talked about a little bit last week. When do they want or need the textbook by, and is it actually doable? Um, as it was said earlier, a lot of times we've gotten a book and then a week later they're like, or we've gotten a manuscript and a week later they're like, okay, is my book ready? No, that's, that's not realistic. It takes us time as publishers to go through and do the work that we do to really make it a book. So making sure that they're not saying, I'm going to be done writing by December so that we can use this book in my class in January. Um, making sure that it is actually doable and that that's realistic. Um, some other good things to discuss with your author, and this kind of is really where the capacity in your publishing program design fits in, in terms of thinking about what are you capable and willing to work on as publishers, and also what, what are you or what are your expectations of your authors. Um, so the general structure of the textbook is really important to discuss. How is it broken up into parts, chapters, sections? Um, what style is used? So Karen mentioned the style guides. Um, do they have a style guide that they're looking to follow based on their discipline? Do you as a publishing program have a style guide that you're kind of basing things off of? We've recently just started working on ours. I'm not actually 100% sure where it stands, but that's something that we're working on and building as we go. Um, there's also the potential if they're working with a scholarly society at all that maybe they want to follow that style guide. So we are co-publishing a textbook right now with a scholarly society. So we're really being cognizant of whether or not this textbook follows kind of that st the style guide that that scholarly society is using. And then also paying attention to any special or trick items. This kind of falls into the vetting, looking at kind of the manuscript or the document and being able to kind of quickly glance through and say, okay, there's a bunch of tables here. There's a bunch of math. These might be things that might cause, I don't want to say issues, but they, they might add to your timeline a little bit, especially when it comes to accessibility. Tables and math can be extremely tricky. So I can't emphasize enough, like being prepared to say, I'm, I'm holding a, a electromagnetics textbook right now, and this one has a ton of math in it. So first glance through this, I know, okay, I need to make sure I set aside an extra week or two for accessibility because these math equations are gonna take some extra work. So just knowing, um, knowing ahead of time that those special trick items are coming your way, it's helpful, especially in terms of setting that schedule. And then if they can provide any sort of outline or sample chap chapter early on, if they know that their book is gonna have 20 chapters and they're gonna be split into five, sec five sections each, um, that, that can be really helpful for you early on because otherwise you might not be knowing if you're getting a book with 10 chapters or 20 chapters. Um, if they can give you a rough idea, even of how many pages a chapter is just in a Word document, Sometimes that can give you an idea um, in terms of the length that you're dealing with as well. Another important thing, and this kind of leads to the workflow idea, is how are they writing? Is it Microsoft Word? Is it a text file? Is it LaTeX, Pressbooks, something else? This really kind of changes the workflow. If you're using something like Pressbooks as your publishing platform, it really is easiest if the authors are willing to edit directly in Pressbooks, but sometimes they're not comfortable with that, or sometimes they already have a finished manuscript that they're working off of in Microsoft Word. So then you have to start thinking about how are we gonna get these Microsoft Word files into Pressbooks? And is that something that we as the publishers are gonna do, or is that something that you're gonna ask your author to do? Um, so making sure that you're having that conversation early on is really important too. And then accessibility is another kind of key thing. I know it's been brought up several times and you all talked about the alt text earlier on, but sometimes the, the idea of who is actually creating the alt text, whether it's you as the publisher or the author, 
should also, is really important to discuss early on because the publishers, there might be an expectation that the publishers are creating the alt text, but the publishers need to rely on the subject expertise that the author provides to have that alt text. So if the publishers are the ones creating it, is there a student or somebody you can hire to help in terms of creating the alt text for that, that has that subject expertise? I can tell you again, I'm holding up this engineering textbook. I look at the figures and graphs in here and they make my head spin. Um, I can't write the alt text for those. We did hire a graduate student to help kind of create all that. Um, but that was an expectation of us as the publishers to create, create those. So then figuring out early on, okay, how are we gonna get these created? When I have a bachelor's in English <laughs> and have no idea how to read an electromagnetics engineering figure. Okay, so kind of had those, those fun conversations. You've set your groundwork for how you're gonna work together. Now actually doing it is a little bit of the trickier part. It's really easy to define those expectations, but following up on them can be a lot easier said than done. Um, making sure that you're checking in regularly, especially right now during a pandemic, is this something that is a top of the priority list for both you and the authors? Um, just following up on all of those things and also revisiting them, maybe changing them over time. Again, use that agreed mode upon mode of communication. Like I said, I had somebody con con uh, contact me over phone going, why can't I get a hold of you? What's going on? And I'm just going, I've never agreed that we should use my office phone as a way to chat. <laughs> Please talk to me over email or I'm available on Slack. I, this is not something I don't always have easy access to my phone. Um, and then checking in regularly, whether that's an in-person meeting or a phone call or a Slack message or an email or whatever, but just making sure you check in regularly. And then the idea of documenting everything, whether that's meeting notes, emails, decisions, and you'll notice I said especially decisions because you want to be sure that everybody is kind of following the same decision-making pattern that somebody said, oh, hey, we're gonna create the alt text and then a week later, somebody else is duplicating that effort because they didn't know that that decision was made. Um, and then also making sure that all that documentation exists in one place where everybody can find it. Maybe that's a Google shared drive or your project management tool or Dropbox, something like that. Um, another good reason to document everything is kind of the hit by a bus scenario or the staffing change scenario, I guess is a more nice way of saying it. Um, so when I worked at Cengage, like I said, I always made sure I put everything in our ticketing systems and I probably had 15 to 20 projects that I was working on at once there. But every piece of communication I had, all of the Word documents that I shared back and forth with our vendors, everything I shared with the content developers who were in charge of kind of building the content for the book with the authors, that all existed in this Jira ticketing system. And when I left, I was able to really easily just take those tickets and assign them to the new project manager. And they had everything I had. Um, actually, I did talk to the new project managers. I remember in the last couple of days I worked there and they said, this is fantastic. Thank you so much for having all this documentation available. And I will say that I did that on purpose because I did have that happen to me where a couple of people had left and left me with nothing. And I spent days, sometimes weeks, just emailing people going, what's going on with this project? I have no idea what I, where I'm even supposed to start. It's midway through. I don't know what work has been done. So just making sure you're documenting everything because staffing changes happen. People get sick, people go on vacation. Pandemics happen. I mean, <laughs> didn't think that this would ever be a scenario I'd be dealing with, but it definitely is one. So I think just making sure that that documentation is there and available can really save you a headache in the future. And then working with third parties. This is something that you might not think about right away. I think a lot of people think about that publisher, author, relationship, but we do also tend to work with vendors. Um, I know Scribe's coming to talk with you all next week. Um, societies, I mentioned the Scholar Society that we're working with, um, and several other layers of people too. So kind of a worst case scenario, and I don't, it's, it's a great project, but this is kind of a headache when you think, think about all the people working on it, is I'm working on a biosystems engineering textbook right now that has every chapter is authored separately. Um, so every chapter has its own author or authors. I think one chapter has as many, about five authors. 
And then the chapters are broken into sections and then each section has its own editors. And then on top of that layer, there's a whole group of oversight team or the main edit editorial team, which is about four people, two people in the US, two people in Ireland. So we have people literally all over the world in different aspects of just the authoring process. And then to top it off, we're working with the scholarly society to co-publish it. And then we're working with Scribe to do the, the layout and production. So the amount of moving parts and people in this project is really growing considerably. And it makes it for a really unique project because it's gonna have a really international um, viewpoint on the topic, but it does complicate things. So in terms of things to consider when working on these complex projects, so you wanna make sure that everybody has the same goals. The, the authors are all kind of leading up to, okay, this is gonna be an open textbook. It is gonna be licensed this way. And I'm comfortable with that as an author. Um, and making sure that you're leveraging the different expertise. So for this case, the scholarly society has the subject expertise that we as the publishers really don't have. So we were able to leverage their experience with the subject to do the copy editing. So they kind of took care of the copy editing while we're taking care of the layout and production. Um, I mentioned the licenses and then also making sure the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. So the authors clearly have the role, the section editors are focusing on those sections. The editorial team has, is the main oversight group. And then what is our role as Virginia Tech Publishing versus the role as the scholarly society and as the publisher and just making sure those are all clearly defined. A great way to do that is to create an agreement or an MOU. We did create an MOU with the scholarly society in this case. Um, not only to just clearly define the roles and responsibilities, but also to make sure that we were all in agreement in terms of who was receiving the book credit lines within the copyright page of the publication as well. Um, so just having that conversation early on. And those, these are things that have been happening during the writing process while the authors are writing that we've also been kind of laying out all of these agreements and getting everything else lined up. Then I would also say sketch when you set your schedule, make sure you're sharing it with all of these different parties and that you're checking in with them regularly. So Elvis at Scribe sends me a weekly email for the work that they're doing on this textbook project. And for me, that's fantastic. All I need, okay, yes, things are on schedule. We're waiting on this from you. That's, that's a dream come true for me because it just quickly tells me this is where things stands or this is something that I have to do still and it helps a lot. So that's not even like a full meeting check-in, it's just one email, but it, it really means a lot. And then in terms of staying on track and making that schedule, um, it sounds like you've heard already, make sure you give yourself extra time. And again, don't be upset if you don't follow that schedule exactly. A couple of weeks ago for this one textbook project, the biosystems one I just mentioned, um, I got an email about oh no, we realized that something is wrong in the list of variables in every chapter of this book. And I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, we have to read you the list of variables in every chapter of this book, which means then I have to recompose them and send them back to Scribe and they have to reconfigure them into the layout and this is gonna be this huge thing and how is that gonna affect the schedule? And I started panicking. But once I stopped and I looked at our schedule again and I said, okay, I built in an extra two or three weeks of time for situations just like this. Where it's okay. And of course, I'm still okay. I think it bumped us out by like a week or two, but everything is fine. We're giving ourselves extra time. No reason to panic there. And then again, check in regularly with everyone involved. Um, I, when I checked in with the editorial team for this book and they found the issue with the variables, I immediately kind of went through, checked in on our end with people I'm working with checked in with Scribe to make sure that the, that was okay with them to make these changes. So just making sure that everybody's in the loop of every, every one of these things that comes up over time is really important. And then making a checklist, especially if you're not using a project management tool, or even if you are using a project management tool, making sure this checklist is incorporated within it. Um, this checklist should really include everything from really large things like the layout or the copy editing to the small things like creating ISBNs or DOIs. Um, make sure that it exists in a shared space for everyone to see an update. Uh, so our, all of our checklists exist in Google Drive. We have a team drive for our publishing unit and we always just kind of go in and 
check off, check off things there. We also identify who works on each of those items. Um, so we just kind of throw our initials into there. So we know kind of whose job that is. <laughs> it keeps people accountable, but it also makes sure that nobody is duplicating efforts in that respect. So I'm not going out and getting a DOI when I know my colleague already has done it or is going to do it. Um, and then note anything special that should be addressed within that checklist. So like I said, any tricky items like the tables or math, if you note them in that checklist, that will just be a good reminder to go back and look at it again once you have that final manuscript and make sure that you're keeping an eye out for those things. It kind of, the checklist can also act as your vetting list in some regard. And then once you see these slides, there is a link to the checklist, um, a, a, an example checklist that I would highly recommend looking at. And then when things go wrong, because they will go wrong, <laughs> um, and that's okay, that's completely okay, as I think Arnie was the one that said to be gentle on yourself when things go wrong. <laughs> um, communication can stop. That means the author can stop communicating. You could stop hearing from the edit editorial team. You could stop hearing from your own coworkers, um, especially right now, and we're all working from home and we're not seeing each other on a regular basis, you, we don't know what's going on. So that's definitely something to consider and just making sure you're checking with people as much as possible. Um, also thinking about schedule changes, those happen, it's okay. Uh, something might get missed in the process. As I mentioned with this list of variables, they found a mistake, something was missed in several chapters and they had to go back and check all the other chapters. That happens, it's completely normal, nothing to panic about. Um, there also might be a misunderstanding <coughs> in terms of what are those defined expectations and goals. Um, so making sure you're having conversations about those. And then the staffing changes, especially I know a lot of us at universities really rely on student employees um, to kind of assist with some of these projects, excuse me. <coughs> and students graduate or they take the summer off. So um, making sure that we're kind of keeping that documentation to really carry through with different employees who might be working on the project. So reach out, make sure you're talking to people. I recently had a case where I was working on actually a digital humanities project where we weren't hearing from the project lead and we weren't hearing from him and we just kept reaching out. Um, unfortunately, he had had a death in the family. So at that point, we knew to kind of take a step back and <clears throat> work on some other things. Um, evaluate your and edit your schedule. It's okay to change it. It's not set in stone the second you write it. Same thing with your checklist. That's not set in stone. You can change things. You can move things around. You can redo things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, refer back to your MLU or your state of goals or any documentation you created early on. Um, again, you can change, especially if it's a more of a informal document, you can change that. You can look back to it and have just open discussions about that. And then if absolutely necessary, think about the things you can cut or you can work on later. Um, so this biosystems textbook, they were originally planning 25 chapters. Turns out we're going to have 23 because two of the chapters just weren't ready. And they really wanted to get this book out this summer. So in order to do so, they decided that they just needed to cut those chapters and they might be able to add them at a later date, but at least for this volume, they're not gonna be able to include them. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then another thing to think about, so for an electromagnetics textbook that we worked on previously, we really wanted to get the PDF available online, but the PDF wasn't fully tagged, access, uh, tagged for accessibility, sorry. Um, so we ended up getting a PDF online that wasn't fully tagged, as well as getting the print on demand version ready, available to students so they could start taking a look at it and getting an idea of things in December. And then once January rolled around, we continued to work on that accessibility, those accessibility features and we're able to get it out by the end of January, which was only about a week into class, so it wasn't a huge issue. But it did, it gave us a little bit more flexibility in terms of the timeline. Um, so within with some communication strategies, you can always anticipate some of the things that come up, but you can't anticipate it all, and that's okay. But some ways to think about how to <clears throat> better anticipate those things 
build off your past experience. Um, like Karen said early on, a lot of this work can is really similar to some other works we do, especially as librarians. I mean, thinking about a reference interview and relation in terms of figuring out what somebody's really trying to research and what their ultimate goal is. And then thinking about how that might relate into what is really their ultimate goal and what are they trying to do by creating this project. Um, so thinking about that overlap and using the skills you already have from other aspects of your job to further build upon how you're going to work on these projects. And ask your colleagues at other institutions what they've dealt with. Um, I'm always open to telling people the stories. They're fun. It's, it's fun to kind of just be open and share what, what we've dealt with over the years, both here and even when I was <coughs> working in commercial publishing. It's just everybody deals with issues and it's okay. And there's no shame in talking about it. And then consider how you might adapt or change your CFP from things you learn from other people as well as from things you learn from yourself. So maybe you get through one project and then you say, oh, okay, we learned a lot and we don't really want to include this in our CFP anymore. Or we want to change this a little bit. So that's what you do and you can change things as the different iterations happen. <coughs> and then it's always okay if something goes wrong. In fact, it's actually normal. If I ever had a full textbook project that went completely as planned, I think I would be a little bit more frightened than if something did if something did go wrong. Um, and remember, you don't have to know everything. You can always ask for help. Um, ask your partners if you're working with vendors or with um, another scholar or society. Ask them for help. They might have some expertise that you're not aware of. You can also look for resources on your campus. So here at Virginia Tech, we have an accessibility access of accessible technologies team that had a all day accessibility hackathon a few years ago. And at the time I was working on tagging and engineering book for accessibility. And I literally showed up at the hackathon and I stayed there for like seven or eight hours and they helped me through everything. They're absolutely amazing. Um, I've gone back to their office several times over the years to ask them questions. And as I run into them at other events on campus, They'll be like, hey, Corinne, did you know that this changed or this updated? Um, so really kind of building those relationships is really can be really helpful. And then also, again, ask your colleagues at other institutions. Um, sometimes there can be something like a weird update that you're not aware of in a, in a platform. Um, or sometimes you might find out that somebody else did something similar. So maybe in the writing process, you can connect an author with a previous openly licensed project so that they can build off of or connect with somebody who's working on one that might be able to ease the project a little bit more. And then make sure you're continually, I've said this multiple times, but just continue to have those open conversations about any challenges that come up or any things that might show up in the MOU or your stated goals. And then probably most importantly is knowing when to say no. It's okay to say no if somebody really is pushing back on, say, the open license, because that's a big one. You can say, you know what, this is really not what our publishing program is doing. We are publishing Creative Commons licensed projects, and if you're not willing to do this, then I'm sorry, we can't work with you. And I know as librarians, especially for me, I sometimes struggle with saying no, but that's, that's what you got to do in some of these cases. Um, so with that, I know I talked really fast, and I'm got a little bit of a sniffle, but does anybody have any questions? Corinne, thank you. You um, really covered a lot of ground and um, we only have a minute left. So if everyone would join me in thanking you, um, we always have class notes for any questions that you, you didn't um, have a chance to get answered and we have clappy hands now. So thank you for your reactions. Um, if, if things do come up, if you want to hear more about some of the projects Corinne talked about, or if you have questions about the spreadsheet I put in the chat, anything at all, please post it in class notes. I'll go ahead and post our chat transcript there too, so you can see all the tips that people shared. And here's the PubFest event link that I mentioned. Check out their calendar. Everything's free and open. You don't have to register. You can just drop in. There's really fun stuff. And I will see you next week. Thank you, and take care. Thank you all. Thanks, Corinne.